Thank you so much, Haskin, and thank you again for organizing this one more time. Everybody having a good time? Back from lunch, got a little break? Good, good. All right, guys, so talking to Justin, I thought that this year, instead of getting you with more data like we did last year, we're going to try to sort of wrap up a bit of what we've been up to in the last three years, try to get a sort of a high level of, you know, why we're we bothering doing all this and what's the state of affairs and where we're going to go next. So we've been hearing a lot about float and flow and, and the advantage and events on the brain. So I'm afraid that I'm going to start with sort of a pessimistic kind of slide, but I think it's an important one. Um, so this is sort of the landscape of mental health care right now, which is obviously something that I care a great deal about, and so does Justin. And this is just, you know, picking up a few disorders that, you know, like brain trauma, schizophrenia, depression, Alzheimer's. And you can see very rapidly how many people this affects and what are both the societal and the financial costs of this disease. And this is growing in a rampant way, and that's due to a lot of things, from increased longevity, which is great, we all get to live until our 100, but, you know, then you have a biological system that needs to keep up with it. Um, and also, you know, the current lifestyle that we do, all the stress factors, we're sort of on call every day with our smartphones, with everything connected, so there's great things about it, but then there, there's a cost and a toll that we pay with it, too. So, some of you guys probably know this, like Ash kind of said from previous years, but for some who doesn't, my background is in neurosciences, neurophysiology. I was a researcher at the National Institutes of Health, at the Mental Health, um, and then at the Salk Institute for Biological Studies in San Diego, La Jolla, and then we created Neuroverse about five years ago. Um, and so, obviously, I'm interested in the brain, how does it work and, and what we can do with it, and how we can, you know, try to at least put a dent on these, you know, problems that we're seeing. And I think that most researchers uh, on the brain and most physicians, uh, mental health care professionals, would agree that we sort of three tips that, that we like to make a difference on the brain. One is understanding it. And we know quite a bit about the brain, but there's still a lot that we need to, to know more and we need to have large-scale deployment populations, both at molecular level studies and full level studies, to get a better understanding. With a better understanding, there's a possibility to improve. And this is one of the things we've been discussing with the float, is how can we improve certain conditions, being mental fitness, being some pathologies, which takes us to curing um, on the case. So, Everyone will tell you, I think, that, that works on neuroscience to say, hey, I'll be really happy if I can create a little bit of the dent in any of these three things, right? If you can do it in two of them, well, that's fantastic, really. And if by some reason you can actually do something that affects the three, then is when I think that you have something truly disruptive for mental health care and from just mental health at large. So, well, when you start thinking about that, how would you go about to, to do something like that? Well, first you need to think that, you know, you have a longevity curve, so, you know, the brain and like any other thing start decaying through life, so we can't just have something that is going to happen at one time of your life. This needs to be whatever disruptive approach that you need to do it. You need to do it throughout the life cycle to try to, for instance, improve mental performance. Um, to some extent, we've seen that if we do that, we can delay decline. So there's studies, for instance, showing that even though we're not curing Alzheimer, but with some cognitive interventions, you can actually delay the onset of neurodegenerative diseases like Alzheimer's for a few years. And, and I can tell you, you know, if you talk to any of the patients, how much that actually matters. It might, it's not a cure, but in any of these disorders, just you know, pushing it back two, three, five years is actually a really big deal. And then, of course, you know, hopefully also find new ways, you know, from interventions like floating, for pharmacology, for whatever it might be, to really treat, you know, some of those neurological conditions. All right, so if we want to do all that, you need to start thinking about, you know, a method, a technology, a treatment, whatever, you know, is, is the landscape that you're working on, that needs to be able to attach to both things. One is dealing with mental pathologies, so things like detection and treatment, but also with brain wellness. You also need to bring this into performance and prevention. So it's not enough to just address the problems when they are actually already there. You actually need to start to figuring out ways to integrate things in real life and into everyday life across a variety of occupations so we can start preventing some of it. And it does really need to be both sides of the coin. 
All right, so how can we start doing something like this? Well, we know quite a bit about the brain and about you know, brain research using all sort of methodology from EEG that you can see the big cap with the electrodes coming out on the left to MRI or PET where you can see this uh, functional maps of brain activity. But all of that, as important as it is and will always be, it stays within the constrained environment of you know, a research or a medical center, right? So if you want to impact something that really you know, is going to go into everyday life, you need to come up with something kind of different. So it needs to be integrative. It needs to be something that can become part of your fabric of everyday life. It needs to be reliable. It can't be a toy, because if not, you're not going to get for the problem, to the problems and, and the markers and the measures that you need to have. It needs to be affordable. Um, if you actually want to be disruptive, this should not be something that you come up for the 1% that can afford it. It needs to be something that people can really at large you know, get into it or buy. It needs to be easy to use. Um, you need to have you know, not your doctor using it, but you know, your 70-year-old you know, sitting on their couch and be able to intuitively use it. You need to be readily available. Um, throughout the country and ideally throughout the world. And then very, very importantly, and we'll bring this up on the context of Float again, but it needs to be personalized. The more that we do research on mental health, the more that we research on brain functioning, we realize that, of course, there's a lot of common patterns, but there's no one size fits all. A lot of the things, and this is going to be true for treatments, uh, medicine is really involving in that way, prevention, it needs to be personalized. You need to know what's happening with that person at that time. So, with all of these things and methods, you know, for us, um, we focus, as Ashken, you know, um, alluded to, and, and we presented in previous years on EEG, on electroencephalography, right? So, in other words, you know, every time that your brain cells fire, your neurons fire, they create electrical energy that goes through your scalp, and we have this passive sensors that measure those brain waves at the level of your scalp, and that is tied up to functioning of different brain neural networks, and we have all that correlation. The great thing about something like EEG is that it's been around for over 50 years. So there's a wide range of brain markers, brain modulations from anything from attentioning, memory, language, that we know that are well correlated to it. So then the question is, how can we really translate it into something that, you know, we can use all these level of markers and knowledge in general society? And Obviously, if um, you want to do something with it, this is not exactly an easy to sport look, right? And uh, bring this together with you know, a big amplifier, a bunch of cables, computers, uh, and a specialized team to help you record this thing. Another aspect of specialized team to analyze this data. Well, now you're seeing what I'm getting with this. You know, in neuroscience, we like to talk about EEG as the portable one, which comparable to a big MRI magnet that costs a million dollars and takes up an entire room, this is quite portable. But portable doesn't mean that you know, it's ready for inclusion in society. So we need to sort of clean it up in many ways. So that looks much better, I think. Um, so that's you know, part of what we spent the last five years developing. Um, something that we call the brain station. And it's an EG system, uh, is wireless, uh, but it's, importantly, is more than a device. It's connected to sort of the three-prong approach where we have a wide range of advanced analytics on a server on the cloud, and we have a uh, series of apps, of applications that run on your smartphone um, to track everything on everyday life from you know, assessment of mental functions, so scoring you know, neurocognitive markers of attention or language or memory or you know, mindfulness, for that matter, um, a host of neurocognitive training games, um, neurofeedback control, sleep tracking. So we really want it to be something that will be truly sort of your brain interface for everyday life, sort of one-stop shop that will be holistic enough that we can really get all those things, and not just because we're greedy, but because we really wanted to be able to integrate this data. There's a lot of stuff that you can be learned for your sleep patterns about how your brain is doing. There's a lot that can be learned by doing specific types of neurocognitive assessment. There's a lot that can be learned by doing neurofeedback. But if they're all detached, you only get one side of the picture. But if you can be in a situation where everything is being embodied into the same environment, then you can really start understanding what's going on with this individual and also all together as a group. So, Flow, right? So we're floating. Flow is definitely, you know, the big keyword uh, for this conference. And you've been hearing about it quite a bit. Um, you'll hear quite more um, on, on the next uh, few speakers. But people have described it as, you know, fully experiencing the present or living in the moment or the present moment of awareness, timeless being, synchronicity. 
And in a way, it's all of these things, and probably much more. But it's a very hard thing to define and to characterize, and it's something that we wanted to do. We know that, you know, from obviously meditators, but also musicians will tell you that they're in the flow when they're, you know, playing a certain piece. Uh, professional athletes, surfers included, you know, will say that when they're out there riding the waves at a certain point, they can get into this zone of being in this state of flow. Um, so we're very interested in, you know, on it because one, we want to understand what it means, but also because of, of the benefits that that seems to bring to the person experiencing them. So we start thinking about in ways of, if we really want to understand this better, we need to find a way to characterize it. So we need to find a way to you know, go beyond the subjective mental experience and look at the brain patterns and first identify it and say, okay, what is the state of flow? Can we identify it? Can we really know when it's happening? Then if we know that, we can start characterizing it. We can start figuring out what is the neural pattern that defines the state of flow. And then if we have those two things, well, now we're in business, now we can really start to figuring out ways to modulate it in a way that you can get you to experience the states of flow more easily, more frequently, sort of ideally get to the point of training where you can experience it on demand and take the advantage that it comes from it. So one of the early things that we did when we started looking into this and, and thinking about different people and different communities that experience this sense of flow, and after all, we are in California, um, so we thought, okay, let's you know, start with surfing. So we you know, ran a, a pilot preliminary study just looking at you know, a couple of things, and one of the things that's really interesting to you, and you guys will see a couple of the videos of Denim, uh, which is a guy working with us, um, surfing, and then uh, you can see on the lower two videos left and right, he's doing the same activity, which is basically paddling, looking for a wave. But the left side is on the early stage uh, of surfing when he's just getting to the water. The one on the right side is after about, you know, 35, 45 minutes of surfing. And you can see that, you know, the patterns are really changing. Um, and they're changing not, you know, just because, you know, he's doing a different activity, in this case he's paddling in both circumstances, is really how his mental state has been changing with the experience. And of course for us it's really important to, you know, go to research flow where it happens, you know, not just do it in a completely artificial situation and try to find, like we said, identify sets of flow. Talk to people on the meditation community, on athletes, musicians, and let us, you know, kind of find, where can we find these states of flow and then start, you know, digging into it which, of course, led us um, here and led us to Justin, uh, which, as Ashken said, literally dragged me into the float business. Um, I, I think I said this a couple of years ago, but you know, I, I worked with Justin for about three years now. Uh, we did all sorts of things, uh, but you know, in the beginning I was very skeptical, and it was really, you know, it was not something I had experience with, and, and Justin was really sort of my serpa, I guess, uh, to these things. Um, so, it's really important for us to have those two sides. One, you want it to sort of be able to go in a wild and figure out where these things is happening. But as importantly, you want to be able to have a controlled environment where we can elicit the states of flow, almost on demand, as I was saying. So that's what, you know, the work at Libra has been fascinating. You heard Justin giving you a lot of evidence and, and now, amazingly, great new papers being published on this. Um, we really wanted to see how does your brain look when you're doing this thing? How does the neural patterns look like? And the first thing was just getting something that would work, right? Um, so you'll see here two examples uh, of time-lapse videos of brain activity throughout floating. If you actually will, will spend some time with this, you'll see there's definitely commonality on it. So there's changes that seem to be constant of a decrease of, of power overall, a shift from high frequencies into low frequencies. They're common, but we also see that, you know, there's differences to them. So again, each person, each experience is not going to be exactly the same. So you need to have a way like this to categorize each one of them. And we're very excited about the very focused mental health um, first evidence that we're starting to see. So Justin mentioned this earlier today about the study look at anxiety and, and serenity changes after a pool when compared to watching a video. Um, we're now actually writing a paper that we're going to be submitting shortly and then we'll be on the same website um, that Justin mentioned uh, the neural changes associated with this. And we're definitely seeing very characteristically brain changes that go with this, which can help us identify states of anxiety and also then figure out you know, how to move away from them. 
Um, so it's very important to, to do this and have these mental health focused things. Um, actually, just being here uh, yesterday out of a conversation with Tom Fine that I think you're going to be hearing for tomorrow, we're really excited about bringing something else that we've been working on independent of the flows, which is migraine, um, that we're able to detect you know, an upcoming migraine episode about 24 hours before the onset of symptoms, but combine that with floating and then trying to start seeing if we can actually reduce migraine uh, incidence and activity by combining floating and use these kind of devices to try. It. So there's a lot of opportunities we're excited about it, but as I mentioned on the beginning, we don't want to stop there. We want to be able to actually bring this out to everyday life, and if we do it on the rest, we also want it to be able to do it, you know, on floating. Um, so, like I said, we've been doing this for five years, but on the last two, even, you know, some of the things that you guys have seen with, with the original studies with Justin, where we're using what we call our Gen 2, there was still a lot of, you know, it was, was great, it was not a big cap, but there was still a lot of things that we felt that was not really ready for, you know, general use for it. So, actually, the floating experience in working with Justin also helps us, you know, really advance the technology itself. So, this is the new thing. So we're very excited about it because in this case, it's something that you have this and your cell phone and you're done and you can do it anywhere, which again opens all the possibilities to really do this research, but more importantly, do implementation of translational therapies, you know, anywhere you want it. Um, we already started yesterday. We had a really interesting panel on research and floating. Uh, we discussed IRBs and all the other requirements to actually do serious research onto this and how could implement this in, in float centers. We already had an IRB in progress. We've been working with people like Just Float with um, Mike and Jim there, and this is actually something recorded at Just Float, just one example um, that you're seeing on, on your right side. So, to summarize in terms of floating, okay, what is in terms of their floating brain, um, the current effects that we can talk about? Well, one, is now possible to record and actually characterize. So remember we said first identify and characterize. We're starting to now being able to characterize how the brain looks like when you're floating. How is it to get in this interceptive state? And what we're finding is that it's a really complex temporal dynamics. It's not just a sort of a switch of you move from, you know, what people like to call, you know, beta to theta or something like that. It's actually a complex pattern, which is very interesting. And for the first time, we'll be able to get some insights on it. The other important thing is they're replicable. And what we mean by this is, is not also that everyone is doing something completely different. There's no rhyme to it. You can actually see common patterns between people, and that's really important because then we know that is a sustained you know, experience that has a common aspect for everyone. Um, and we also know that modulations of these contributions of high and low frequency bands, and we know which brain areas and neural networks are associated with this, are actually correlated with the mental subjective experience of the flow state. So, again, I said this before, but I'll come back to this, is personalized, right? So we have these common trends, but it's not going to be enough to say, oh, we did this with 30 people, we kind of have a notion of how it looks like. So now we can, you know, do it with 30 million and just have that neural signature, that template. You actually use that as a guidance, but then you really have to have a system where you have to be running each one of those persons to get into those personalized experience, then in turn will help us producing the translational approaches. The other thing we're excited about is, just like with meditation, training and experience matters. It modulates. It modulates the experience on a float, and it modulates the neural changes. We're seeing when we compare patterns for you know, experienced floaters with naive floaters, and then track these naive floaters over the course of three, five, ten floats, we see changes on the neural pattern that start getting closer to the guys who have much more experience. Um, so again, this is great, because then it means that we can train it, and if you can train it, you can use it in a positive manner to reinforce you know, all sort of solutions. So then again, how do we bring this into everyday life? So we're able to record on the float, we're able to use float things, but then how do you make it part of everyone to be able to use it, and it's not just floating in isolation? Well, we partner and we try to explore other avenues. Uh, one of them that I'm very proud of saying is we're starting to work with Deepak Chopra and Punasha. You're going to hear him talking uh, later today about states of float to actually, you know, characterize meditation and mindfulness experiences in the light of float as well and bring it all together. And why? Because ultimately what we really want to do is being able to characterize neural patterns of interest. And it can be a mindfulness, you know, with a meditation practice. It can be, you know, pure attentional focus. It can be the floating experience. Once you characterize these patterns, once you know what they look like, 
and you have a neural analysis sustaining that, then you can create, which is what we've done, brain signals and neurofeedback, where basically, if I know how you look like when you're in that state, and then I'll give you, you know, a meditation training exercise to do at home, let's say, okay? And I can track you in real time what your brain is doing. At the end of the exercise, I can tell you how close you are or not from your intended goal to being in a certain state. So that allows really, you know, one, bring the floats together with everything else that we're doing and everything else we're doing in a holistic way, but also to give you a tool to keep training and make this part of an entire program instead of just an isolated experience. So the idea again to being, you know, having an holistic aspect on the same platform, mindfulness, floating, sleep, all sort of neurocognitive assessment, neurofeedback tools, in our view, it really helps us attached to the two things, the mental performance aspect, um, where we can you know, develop integrated mindfulness and training programs at many levels, but also the more medical-oriented stuff with preventive and therapeutic programs. And this is how we really think that we can have an impact on the three parts of the triangle and go beyond you know, just one simple kind of, of tool hack into have something that could really hopefully be disruptive throughout you know, a whole sort of applications. Not just medically, but you know, on meditation or sports, but with executives, we're working with people at special operations, uh, we're working with sports teams, uh, Justin alluded to that today with, with NFL and others. So it's really about creating this platform where you can bring all of the aspects of your mental performance and of your brain performance, you can take advantage of information from all of them, but also can start creating some translational benefits that you can bring into everyday life. And I think that Panache will tell you more about float, so I'm excited to hear that. Thank you everyone and it's good to be here again. <laughs>